For nearly a millennium, Constantinople was the largest and wealthiest city in the Christian world. And deep into the Middle Ages, it was the only city of all the thousands scattered across the territories of the former Roman Empire that continued to look and feel ancient. Chariots still raced in the Hippodrome. The forums were still studded with statues of generals and gods. The time-honored ceremonies of the Roman court still wound their stately way over the cracked marble floors of the imperial palace. Sculptures by the great masters of classical Greece stood in the public places. Ancient manuscripts crowded the libraries of monasteries and court. In dozens of cabinets and reliquaries, thousand-year-old gemstones and jewelry gleamed. And then, in a few bloody days, it all disappeared. The soldiers of the Fourth Crusade, diverted from the Holy Land by a promise of gold, had helped a fugitive prince overthrow the reigning emperor of Byzantium. But when that prince was assassinated by a rival, and when the new emperor refused to pay them, the crusaders decided to seize Constantinople for themselves. On April 12, 1204, the crusaders breached the seawall. Over the next three days, as fires raged and thousands were put to the sword, the capital of the Roman Empire was sacked with barbaric ferocity. Ancient manuscripts were torn to shreds for their jeweled covers. Golden vessels and silver altar screens were hacked apart. Statues were torn from their bases and melted down. And almost everything of value that survived was stolen, either confiscated by the Crusades' leaders or smuggled away by common soldiers. Most of these treasures found their way to Western Europe, where a remarkable number can still be seen today. This video will focus on five of the most spectacular examples and on their stories after being stolen from Constantinople. We'll begin with the Farnese Cup, now in the Naples Museum. This masterpiece of ancient gem carving, cut from a single piece of sardonyx agate, was made in Alexandria sometime between the early Hellenistic period and the reign of Augustus. The reliefs on its inner face, shown here, may commemorate some important event, or they may simply be an allegory for the fertility of the Nile. The outer face of the bowl shows the head of Medusa, a conventional means of averting evil. Whatever the precise meaning of the cup's iconography, its shape suggests that it was used for a ritual purpose, such as pouring libations. The early history of the cup is obscure. At some point, it was brought to Constantinople, where it was apparently used as a Christian chalice. After the sack, it was sold to the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, an enthusiastic collector of Roman artifacts. The cup next appears, rather unexpectedly, at the court of Timur, a Central Asian warlord who conquered an emperor stretching from Armenia to India. Though best known for his ruthlessness, he liked to build pyramids of skulls outside cities who resisted him, Timur was fond of beautiful objects, and apparently received the Farnese cup as a diplomatic gift. After Timur's death, the cup found its way back to Italy. It was purchased by Alfonso of Aragon, seized by Pope Paul II, and became the centerpiece of Lorenzo de' Medici's famous collection of ancient gems. It was admired by the artists of Renaissance Florence, so much so that, in his Birth of Venus, pictured here, Botticelli is thought to have modeled the two figures on the left, the wind god Zephyrus and a female companion, on figures from the cup. In the 16th century, the cup passed to the Farnese family, and finally to the kings of Naples. The cup's mount was stolen in 1903, and the cup itself was damaged by a deranged curator with an umbrella in 1925. It was walled up in a small compartment during the Second World War, but it survived and still resides in its case on the first floor of the Naples Museum. Our next example is the Gemma Constantiniana, or Great Cameo of Constantine, now at the Dutch National Museum of Antiquities. A cameo is a gemstone carved in relief, often in a way that uses a stone's contrasting colors for artistic effect. This is an unusually large and fine example, cut into agate, which shows Constantine in a triumphal chariot with his mother, his wife, and his oldest son. Victory rushes to crown the emperor, and two centaurs trample his enemies. The cameo was commissioned by the Roman Senate, and probably presented to Constantine in 315, 
three years after his famous victory at the Milvian Bridge. It was brought to the new city of Constantinople, and there it remained, likely in the imperial treasury, until the Crusaders came. After the sack, the cameo was apparently brought to France. Its history is obscure, however, until the early 17th century, when it was purchased by the great Flemish painter Peter Paul Rubens, an enthusiastic collector of antiquities, who kept Roman artifacts in a special room adjacent to his workshop. After only a few years, however, Rubens found himself short of cash and was forced to sell his collection. The cameo was purchased by an Amsterdam jeweler who mounted it in an elaborate golden frame and devised a plan to sell it to Jahangir, the Mughal emperor of India. And so, the cameo was loaded, along with ten chests of silver and many other treasures, into the hold of the Batavia, the new flagship of the mighty Dutch East India Company. The long voyage east, troubled from the start by tensions among the crew, turned disastrous on June 4, 1629, when the Batavia struck a reef in the uncharted waters off Western Australia. As the ship sank, most of the 320 passengers managed to escape onto two tiny islands nearby. The commander and senior officers set out in the ship's boat in a desperate bid to reach the Dutch colony in Java. Within a few days of their departure, the survivors left behind on the islands chose Euronymus Cornelis, a disgraced former merchant, as their leader. Over the next few weeks, Euronymus ruthlessly consolidated power, stranding those who opposed his authority on other islands and urging his followers to murder those who opposed him. By the time the ship's commander returned with a rescue vessel, Euronymus and his gang had killed more than a hundred of their fellow passengers. The ringleaders were interrogated and hanged for their crimes, and the treasures of the Batavia, including the cameo, were brought to Indonesia. The cameo was then carried to India, where attempts were made to sell it to the Mughal court. When these failed, it was marketed to the Shah of Persia and various princes in India and Indonesia. None were willing to pay the asking price. And so, in 1656, the great cameo of Constantine returned to Holland. After two centuries in the hands of private collectors, during which most of its elaborate jeweled frame was broken off and sold, the cameo was purchased by the Dutch king and is now displayed, along with other antiquities from the royal collections, in the museum at Leiden. A few treasures from Constantinople have crossed the Atlantic to America. Of these, the most famous and important is the Rubens Vase, now at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. This masterwork, carved from a single piece of agate, is covered with delicately rendered grapevines and acanthus leaves, and features two satyr heads in the place of handles. The vase was probably created in Constantinople around the year 400, almost certainly for a member of the imperial family. It may have remained in the palace treasury until it was stolen by the Crusaders. It was sold to the Dukes of Anjou, and eventually made its way into the collections of the French kings. Then, possibly after it was stolen by a band of rebels, it appeared in the markets of Paris, where it was purchased, like the great cameo of Constantine, by Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens, as we have seen, loved his antiques, and the vase was the star of his collection. He sketched it at least once, making the drawing shown here. But in 1626, he sold the vase, likely at the same time as the cameo. The vase may have even joined the cameo on the disastrous voyage of the Batavia, but unlike the cameo, it was eventually sold to the Mughal court and spent some time in India. After two centuries of obscurity, the vase resurfaced in 1818, when it was purchased by William Beckford, an immensely wealthy English politician and author. Beckford used his money to build a colossal faux Gothic manor called Fonthill Abbey, which he filled with his art collections. Eventually, however, his many extravagances caught up with him, and he was forced to sell the vase. This proved to be fortunate, since the 300-foot tower of Fonthill Abbey collapsed only a few years later, destroying almost the entire house and everything in it. The vase's later history is less dramatic. It passed through a series of aristocratic English hands before being purchased by the American art collector Henry Walters and finally by the Walters Art Museum. Our final examples are in the treasury of St. Mark's Basilica in Venice. The Venetians spearheaded the Fourth Crusade, 
and there are literally dozens of treasures from Constantinople in the collection. For our purposes, the most interesting items are the two chalices of the Emperor Romanus, one of which is pictured here. Both chalices are hybrids, consisting of ancient sardonyx bulls decorated with Byzantine goldwork and enamel. This is the other chalice. Like its counterpart, it was apparently commissioned by the 10th century emperor Romanus II, who is commemorated by an inscription on the base, God help the Orthodox Emperor Romanus. The plaques along the rim, which show Christ with the saints and archangels, are masterpieces of Middle Byzantine art. Unlike the other artifacts in this video, the chalices remained in one place after their theft. History, however, came to them. Shortly after their arrival in Venice, the chalices survived a catastrophic fire that destroyed many of the relics from Constantinople. Not long after, they escaped the attention of a daring thief who snuck into the treasury and seized some of the most valuable treasures. The thief, incidentally, was later caught and hanged beside the church. The chalices also managed to outlast the era of the Napoleonic Wars, when many objects in the treasury were melted down for their gold and silver, and dozens of precious stones were sold to raise funds for the restoration of the basilica. They're still in the treasury today, lapped by floodwaters and tides of tourists, eight centuries and half a world away from the smoldering ruins of Constantinople. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Tolden Stone on Patreon. You might also be interested in my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.